Hey, and welcome to the FitPro Lead Gen Podcast. It's proudly sponsored by Lead Deck, the all-in-one tool that helps you manage and automate the leads into your fitness business. Today, we have another massive guest interview for you. But before we do dive into this week's guest interview, be sure to come join us inside the Facebook group where you can watch these guest interviews live and ask your questions. Simply click the link in the description below to join the group. Anyway, enough of me talking. Let's dive into this week's guest interview. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a brand new live guest interview. This week, we're lucky enough, and you know what? It's taken me a while to be able to get Debbie on here, but we finally got Debbie on here to talk about everything finance. So if you're struggling with your tax, your VAT, your, your lead cost, loads of any anything basically to do with finance, Debbie is hopefully going to help us fix all of it today. So no pressure at all, Debbie. How are things? <laughs> Good, thank you. Yeah, sorry, it has taken us a while to organise it, hasn't it? But um, we're here now, so it's all it's all good. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so one of the big reasons I wanted to get you on because a lot of people always ask, like, "Oh, Dave, I'm really struggling with my tax return, or how much should I be saving every month for? What do I need to do when it comes to VAT?" Because again, we get a load of fitness businesses come in who are kind of at that stage of VAT, or they've not really been taking their tax seriously before. And then in the flip side, we've got some who are like really major companies already and they want to see, like us, how we can reduce our VAT. So I think we'll maybe start right from the beginning for real new starter fit pros and then we'll kind of work our way through all the way to those who have a couple of units. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I cool. think the, th the thing with VAT is that um, a lot of people get stuck there and it's less of... The re like because it is confusing it's more because they've got this thing in their head that they're going to end up worse off and they're like scared of understanding the VAT and the processes behind it and also going over that if you'd like at seven, say you're at just over the VAT threshold you're at 86 87k turnover if you don't pass that on to this the customer suddenly you're worse off mm. and so that scares a lot of people to make that leap over the VAT threshold and then they keep themselves below it artificially but like they restrict how much sales they make they maybe even restrict their pricing to keep themselves below it which is a real shame because actually if they can smash through it then there's no problem at they all don't need to worry about it anymore that's no, nice nice okay so let's start right from the start then I've just qualified I'm a brand new fit pro I'm going self-employed for the first time ever what are some of the things I need to consider straight away to make sure that I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot a year down the line, two years down the line, because I've not been saving properly. So the first one is registering as self-employed, because you are meant to do that as soon as you start trading. So making sure you register as self-employed with HMRC. Two is making sure you keep all your invoices, because HMRC can come back seven years and ask for evidence of any costs that you've put onto your tax return. And you can claim pre-trading costs. So it's important to make sure you keep everything related to the business and make sure you claim them because it's kind of gutting when people come um, and they want to claim, say, their website costs, but they haven't kept any evidence of them or they can't find it. Or the big one I find is like PayPal. So they buy, buy a bit of equipment on PayPal, don't keep any record of it. And I think one of my clients, do they wipe it after like a couple of years, PayPal? Well, it's quite difficult to find so then it was like well you haven't got any evidence of what you've purchased so we can't claim it so keep all register of hmrc keep everything associated with the business make sure you keep the receipts i would scan them or take them photo and put it onto like a google drive OneDrive, somewhere like that where you can access them um find out what costs you can claim a lot of people wrongly assume that because you say wear trainers all the time or jogging bottoms or whatever fitness clothes to do your role that actually you can claim it, which you can't. Um, HMRC consider that you need to be decently dressed so <laughs> and preserve your modesty. So therefore clothes are not um, allowable expenses, except if you get them branded up, then <laughs> of course they are allowable. So yeah, get your fitness uh, gear um, branded up 
and then it's a tax deductible cost. So just jumping um, in quickly there, I could go and buy a £250 wear pair of Nike trainers, put my logo on it, and then I can claim it. Yeah, so if they're branded up, you can claim them. <laughs> okay, just could just go back to the first, first, first step. You said we need yep. to register with the HIMC. Is that really easy to do? Is that just um, declare myself self-employed in Google and you'll be able to find it, or is it quite complicated to find that? Yes, just um, just type into Google. The HMRC website should come up first. Don't pay anyone to like do it for you. Um, setting up a self-employed because there's like websites that sometimes come up they use that they tag on somehow to like the government website and you know like passports it's been quite common yeah. pass and you pay them to do something for you actually you can just go on the hmrc website and it's free to do um it's really easy you just need to know like your business name national insurance number those sort of things um setting up as limited is a lot more difficult but self-employed is quite easy um, and I would set up a separate bank account as well in the business, like in the business name, so that it keeps it all clean and tidy. Nice. Okay. And then you mentioned about keeping receipts and stuff, and I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's, I'm li I've got. I need to find the venue. I need to find clients. I need to do this. I need to do all, all this stuff. And now you say I need to keep my receipts as well. Surely just swiping my card or using my phone or whatever to pay and the bank transfer on the state, my bank transfer statements, isn't that good enough? Do I actually have to keep each individual receipt? Yeah, well, if it said, say, co-op on there, like HMRC wouldn't have a clue what that cost is. It could just be you buying your lunch, which is not tax deductible. Or if it says PayPal, that could be anything. Like when some of my clients <laughs> occasionally buy personal spend through their paper, they get the PayPal mixed up and they put personal spin in front and go, oh, why did you go to Boots? And it's just personal stuff. So you do need to have the receipts because HMRC could question that. And you would be really annoyed if you'd purchased something and then HMRC came along, disallowed those costs, and you therefore owed more tax. So in mm. the fitness world, you get so, like, no one wants to pay more tax. They begrudge paying the tax. So do the really, really simple things, which is keep your receipts. So I like have an app on my phone um, and I just scan it straight into HubDoc. But before that, I was using um, Adobe so or just take yep. a picture of it. And if you're doing it regularly, like every time you get a receipt, you just take a picture of it. Or every time you get an email, you just direct that to OneDrive, your accounting software, Google Drive. It will just become a habit and you won't even, it literally takes seconds to do nice and i've seen like with that well, with us we bank with starling so every time we purchase something we can load up the starling and then it's like scan your receipt or take a picture of receipt, yeah. and that goes into there so then like you say you've got that for future reference as well yeah I, I use starling too and it literally comes up on your screen you've spent this much money at this place um you click on it and it says add a receipt so like you said it's just really it's really easy um and like, if you imagine, I have got receipts of some people and you open them and it's like, well, like, you know, it's all fading. You can't read it. So HMRC, they're going to be like, well, you can't, that's not proving anything. Okay. So just, so I think just take everything you can. <laughs> We've done that first year in business now. It's it's going well. We've we've we're, we've grown. We were adding clients and things are going well. And we've been saving all the receipts and everything like you say. And we've got a new bank account. We've self we've put ourselves as self employed. We've done everything that we need to do. And then the first email comes in from HMC. Now it's time to do your tax return or your self assessment. Do I need to reach out to a specialist like you? Do I need to get something like Zero or QuickBooks? Or can I literally do it all in a Google Sheet and submit it all myself online? So making tax digital was coming in in 2024, which meant that it would have to be done with a digital link, which effectively meant using software. But HMRC have pushed that out to 2026. So you can use a spreadsheet um, and code, like allocate everything on your spreadsheet and do the calculations and then enter it yourself and submit to HMRC. But it depends how comfortable you are with the rules and what you can and cannot claim. So for a PT who hasn't got masses of costs, that might be the best option for them. 
someone who's then starting to build a gym and has equipment etc I, I would suggest that getting someone who knows a bit more about what they're doing in because there's more risks involved there's more complicated claims so what you can claim can't claim how much things like annual investment allowances so the words start to get more complicated um but you can use a spreadsheet i personally don't work with people that use spreadsheets because i want everything online you know, i think it makes it easier yeah. it shows you where you are so you can every month you know where you are because the bank's connected in and you can see where you are you can start to estimate how much tax you're going to owe so you can put that aside you can see how profitable the business is you can see ups and downs in the months whereas a spreadsheet just doesn't unless you're a whiz doesn't do it and it's probably going to have mistakes nice, so nice. One of the really annoying things though between Starlink and Zero is I think it's every 90 days the token expires and you've got to reconnect the whole thing again. It's kind of a palaver because you've got loading into the Starlink app that then takes you to Zero, which then you've got to log into Zero, which you need to get a code so it's double opt in. Oh, and it's, why can you just have, <laughs> don't stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, there is um, that was an EU rule and they've been trying to change it through open banking. So I had an email from Zero a month or so ago to say that that is changing. Um, it's not all banks yet. They're working through the banks and their open connections to Zero, um, And it will be literally go in and just click confirm. So you won't have to re-log into the bank, et cetera. Oh, You'll just have to click confirm. You've got to confirm the dates and everything. Oh. So it will. Yes. <laughs> it is coming yes, to make it easier. Good. Stressful. Okay, so the first show's gone. Uh, we're, we're doing really well, like you say. We've 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 gone digital. We've submitted everything, and now the second and third years coming in, our, our profits going Sorry. up. We're spending more as well, and it's starting to get a little bit more difficult. And then we finally reach out to yourself. I'm guessing. And how much easier is it having a bookkeeper or an accountant on board than trying to do it all yourself? Well, it's all about expertise, isn't it? Like the way I, I spoke, speak to it with like a gym owner or a PT is if I wanted to get fit, I'm going to have like so much motivation to do it. And then I'm kind of, I'm not really going to know how to lift the weights properly. I'm probably going to go in, hurt my back, pull a shoulder, which I have done, um, hurt my knees. I just don't know exactly what I'm meant to be doing. So I'll kind of um, amble along, but I'll probably end up injured having to stop working out and falling behind so with a gym owner their expertise is in building the gym keeping people fit understanding how to lift weights how to use the equipment and trying to juggle all these things as well as do something like finance which is probably not their expertise something's going to fall and what I often find is it is the account side that falls down it becomes they deem it like not important um, until it all goes wrong and then I end up with a set of accounts and information that's there's things missing things have been claimed wrong things have been put for the accounts that they shouldn't have been uh, tax has been overpaid because it's not their priority it's not they don't find it interesting they don't want to spend time on it they don't understand it and so it gets left it's mm. kind of like me and my website <laughs> it just gets left so it makes it easier because you think, oh, I'm paying all this money for an accountant. But actually what an accountant should do is it should free up your time so you can concentrate on profit making tasks. They should get the accounts right so you're not going to get in trouble with HMRC. They should save you tax and they can help drive your business forward by looking at the numbers, explaining them to you and showing you how you can use them yeah. and where you can move forward. So it's mm -hmm. like outsourcing anything, really it should make your life easier and you can then concentrate on what you do best. Okay. So should the good accountant also know where we can potentially save money, maybe when it comes to uh, business rates or uh, tax changes or VAT changes and stuff? Should the accountants be giving us those insights? So should we also be looking out there to see maybe what grants and what fundings and what discounts and stuff that we can get on those type of things? So for tax changes um, and those sort of things, that's what the, depending what package you have with the accountant. So if you've just got like a year end accountant, um, very low priced, they're just going to do the compliance side. If you're paying for kind of more consultancy work, 
then the accountant will be talking to you about tax savings, um, how you can use the tax rules in your benefit. Um, if they're doing the VAT return for you, they should be looking at what scheme you're on. Is that the best scheme for you? And highlighting when you should change over, because sometimes it's missed when the people move from like flat rate to standard rate, that changeover sometimes missed. So the accountant can help you and give you confidence in that. In terms of grants and stuff, if you reach out to the accountant, um, they might be able to help you with that. But it's probably not something that's common for the accountant to do just because during COVID, certainly, we were the ones passing on all the information around the grants, um, the loans, etc. And what was available and like discounted rates, etc. Um, but now things are back to normal. The grants are probably more like localised. Yeah. I'm finding so like you know your your council will have grants and stuff. Okay, so we've we're we're, we're moving along nicely now, and we're getting close to the seventy four thousand pound number. And I'm sure that's what VAT still is, right? Seventy four thousand pound. In my head, I'm thinking it's eighty five. <laughs> I'm like it's eighty five. Maybe. Because it, 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 it's, it's been going up and up and up. So we're getting close to that number now. And like we said right at the start, that some people are, are kind of cautious, maybe even a little bit scared of hitting that number. And they kind of do almost everything possible to not get to that number. Because we know, like, you have the flat rate scheme. And then you have to kind of, when you get past a certain threshold, then you have to go to straight up 20% or 19% or whatever it is. So what should we do if we're getting close? Do we kind of just hold back or do we actually just try and blow it out of the water? Or is there kind of like that kind of middle ground where we can be slightly over and it doesn't impact us too much? So there's like two things at play. One is looking at your future forecast and will have you got a business and a unit size that can accommodate the bigger turnover or are you, are you at a size and you're kind of contained within your unit and your model that actually you're probably only going to turn over 87k because they're kind of different situations and can your price cope with having that 20 percent put on top and charging that to customers so that's why it comes down really to individual business but if you're going to kind of hit 87k and you're not you're not really ever going to get above that because of the restrictions of your unit size and your model then and you're not going to pass the 20% on then all you're actually going to end up in a worse off position yeah. so you might be better kind of holding back but that's why you need to be looking at your finances regularly because actually I've got I've taken over gyms which have passed that already. They passed it like three, four months ago and they didn't know. And then they have no option because they're already at that point. So yeah. that's why you need to be monitoring your rolling cash, your rolling income every 12 months. Um, but if you're going to like smash it out of the park and your unit is big enough and you're going to hit the 150K, you're going to hit good turnover numbers, then go for it. Like don't let the VAT hold you back because that's a mindset thing in that you think oh I can't charge it to onto customers oh I'm going to be worse off oh the government are just greedy and that's going to hold your business down and your profit down you can only earn so much profit from 85k whereas if you're going to smash it out of the park then go and do that and go and earn those big profit go and earn more profit and take home more money for your bit like for you and your business so it kind of depends how big the business is going to be. But that's why you need to monitor your numbers. Because like I said, you might pass it and then you've got no option but to just get on with it. Okay, so here's an interesting form for you. And something I've seen a lot in a number of Facebook groups, and you've probably heard people say this before, is, okay, I'm over my VAT threshold. So what I've done is I've created two companies one that gets me up to about 60,000 and the other one that does another 40,000 still out of the same gym, still out of the same business. I've just created two companies to kind of make sure I don't go over. Now, mm -hmm. is that allowed? 
or is that definitely not allowed and kind of talk us about that for the people that maybe their accountants has said try and do that um it's considered artificial separation and VAT fraud I had someone talk to me about the other day and they said um oh if I just move the VAT over there if I just move the sales over there so I can avoid avoid VAT and I was like what words did you just use you used VAT avoidance which is <laughs> not allowed um you cannot separate a business into two simply to avoid VAT um if the businesses are very common so you've got like the same directors and shareholders you're using the same cash system like say go cardless or whatever and they're like in the same building you're going to find it very very difficult to convince hmrc that they're different businesses hmm. um you know like you've got multinational companies who like i used to work for bae who done planes ships land they're still one company but they just have different services so it is very difficult to have separate businesses. Um, the only time it's sometimes worked is if the husband runs the gym. I'm being very sexist there, and I. If one of the people runs the gym and then the other partner decides that they want to make a coffee shop nearby and they're sort of linked, but they're not, they're run completely separately, um, not connected, they were set up separately, then potentially it can be done. But otherwise, no. <laughs> it can't be done you can't you can't just to separate two businesses they have to be different so we're businesses. saying that the the one partner might just run the gym as an open gym and the other partner then might do small group within that gym both owned by two different people and maybe that's one way of doing it but otherwise it's not really possible at all yeah yeah if you're married all those sort of stuff you use in the same place it all just interconnects each with each other and it would become very grey with HMRC. And then the last thing you want is them to come back and be like, right, you owe us all this VAT, all this corporation tax, and we're going to put penalties on you, and we're going to fine you, and we're going to disqualify you as a director. So <laughs> the risks so are just too... You're basically high. saying don't do it. Just don't do it. No, no. If you've got like one one gym over here and then you've got another gym over there it might be that you can do that and they're two different people they're in two different locations because obviously you get like people who have more than one unit you yeah, can set them up as a group format maybe cool yeah and because that, that is I mean, we, we see it and hear it all the time people's always ask me what do we do about vat and stuff and it's always been no the gym it just has its own VAT. There's no way to kind of duck and dive because my accountant said the same thing that like you will get in real big trouble um, if they catch you. So let, yeah, don't do that. Okay. So we've talked about VAT there. We, we kind of just need to really go for it. And let's say our business, it just can't get there. Like we said, 87 might be that number, but we can only really get to, let's say 92, 95, maybe even a hundred what do we do in that kind of situation there's no real extra growth possible we're only able to get to that kind of number <laughs> sorry um it will come down to individual circumstances but people are so scared to pass on that that charge to their clients they are petrified that the clients will leave and um, the members will leave they're petrified that they'll look bad for putting the price up. Like I saw a post go out the other day on Instagram, one gym going, basically begging their client with their members. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This has happened. That's I'm, I'm really sorry. I have to put up my price by 50p. And it's like, O2 emailed me and we're like, we're putting up your price by 18%. Yeah, like, I got that what? email. <laughs> 18%. Um, and you're in a contract. So you're stuck, aren't you? Um, and they just get so scared. I got one off track then. But yeah, they just get so scared about putting their price up. And I've been working with some of my clients to encourage them to try it out, see what yeah. happens, and don't go around begging your members. Just be straight with them. The price needs to go up. Everyone knows what's happening at the moment. So one CrossFit gym, they were charging eighty pounds a month. Every other CrossFit gym near them was charging a hundred. I was like, oh, so you're you're not as good as them then. You're 20% crapper than they are. That's what you're saying. 
He yeah. was like, no, I'm better. My, my site is better. I provide better support. I provide better customer service. It's like, well, why are you 20% cheaper then? And he's like, oh, I'm worried because before I'd experienced like a bad, you know, had a bad experience putting my price up. Yeah. And so he'd done like a little trial, tested it. And actually it was fine. So he didn't go the whole hog, which is fair enough. He put his price up to 95 and he did lose members, but he lost the members that actually annoyed him and yeah, yeah, created yeah. a bit of a, and ruined the culture slightly. So he lost them, but actually the people that he gained, he gained more members at the higher price. And so he's in a much better position than he was just by having the confidence to go forward with that price increase. Yeah. So yes, the VAT can be scary to pass on. And for some people, maybe they are at a top limit and the price can't be pushed, but it's understanding your market, your location and the customer service and value you provide and being confident that you can pass that VAT on. And then if you're on flat rate scheme anyway, and your outgoings of VAT are not massive, you will only pay over eight and a half percent to HMRC. Mm. So you're not going to be paying over that full 20% to HMRC. So, so um, yeah. we we increased our price last year. And what we did is we give everybody three months notice. So we basically said in three months time, the price is going to go up by five pound a month. Mm. Um, and I think we had four people not carry on after we put it up, which like you say is not bad at all. And like we then you got 80 odd people who now pay an extra five pound uh, a month more. OK, so let's talk about um, the flat rate scheme. For my knowledge of the flat rate scheme is if you're on a flat rate scheme, you can't claim VAT back unless you do a bulk order of more than £3,000 at once. Is that correct? £2,000. Yeah, so it's only certain items that you can claim. Um, and they have to be over two thousand pounds. So it's more like fixed assets. Um, gym equipment is an obvious one to pick because they're generally quite expensive anyway. Yeah. So instead of buying again, old, that's what, I was told. Hmm? that's what I was told. It was like in, don't buy little bits of equipment here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> buy it in bulk, so it's over that amount. So then you can claim that VAT back. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's like a leg press, and then a ben your bench, and you don't buy one, and then two months later buy another try and buy them together that's more likely to push it over the two thousand pounds um, and then you can claim the vat back on that otherwise there's no claiming of vat but one thing that i probably is worth talking about because i went for it recently is um you know these initial fat returns so when you first get fat registered you can go back four years and claim vat on like fixed assets um, and you can go back six months for services. And you can do this even if you're on the flat rate scheme, because I've had other accountants tell me that's not the case. So another gym owner said to me, my accountant said, and I was like, no, it's crap. And I sent her all the, you know, the extracts from HMRC and le le legislation. I can't say that word. And I then had a discussion with HMRC. They came back and said oh, we were wrong. And I was like... <laughs> here's your leg legislation, here's extracts from your website, blah, blah, blah. And then they came back and said, well, they didn't even say I was right. They basically just gave my client her £18,000 and that was that. Um, nice. So don't let them tell you that you can't do it on flat rate because you definitely can. Um, but it's also, yeah, worth noting. So if you, that's what I'm saying about keeping your receipts. Say you go VAT registered, you can go back four years and claim the VAT back on all that equipment if you haven't got the receipts i've done two recently one was 14k one was 18k Massive, cash yeah. so it's worth it's a pain in the ass but it's worth doing okay so a question on that one because i didn't know that uh statistic or that kind of thing if we've been paying vat for six months maybe two or three years and we didn't know about this can we go back and try and claim it back from when we did or once you start paying VAT and you go over I don't know two months or three months in you then can't go back to your previous stuff and claim the VAT back off that I would need to double check so under normal under normal VAT rules there is a time limit that you can go back and correct things 
for the initial VAT return, you're meant to have everything on that first VAT return because then you can go through a first VAT return inspection. Okay. So I would need to check if you could do that. It might be that oh. you could write to HMRC and explain. You're going to get a load um, of people messaging you like, you're going to get a load of people message you now, Debbie, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the one I'm doing with my client later um, actually is looking at memberships and Ryan talks about it a lot um, where, you know, you can charge, like you can do an annual membership and people can pay up front. So they could pay you like £300 up front for the year or they're in an annual contract and they pay... I don't know, £35 a month um, because you're basically financing them through the year and then you yeah. can claim like zero rate VAT on the addition. So I'm actually going to go in with doing that with my client later today. <laughs> explain that again one more time. <laughs> yeah. Could you explain it again one more time just so we can try and all get it? So if you have annual contracts yeah and you present two options to your members so you say you sign yeah. up for 12 months it's 300 pounds but you've got to give me 300 pounds now yeah or it's 35 pounds a month and you pay that every month but you're tied into a 12 month contract yeah the diff i don't know what 35 times 12 is <laughs> i should have picked a better number <laughs> So whatever the difference is between those two, so let's just do it on a calculator because, yeah, 420 minus 300. So that 120 pounds can be at zero VAT because it's considered like financing and financing okay. doesn't attract VAT. Um, not a lot of, like quite a lot of my gyms don't necessarily tie people into annual contracts now. So it's becoming less of a thing um because they're having rolling contracts rather well, than you've just said contracts. that everybody's now going to start selling yearly packages to try and get that money back yeah well yeah so today actually we speak <laughs> one of my clients we're speaking to later um we're going to look at the contract to um yeah try and get more of that in place <laughs> cool we had a question come in about what we talked about a minute ago so regarding oh, claiming back vat uh four years prior if you are flat rate, can you only claim purchases over 2K then? No, <laughs> anything. No. So if you go backwards, when you first register flat rate, when you go back, you can claim anything. So it's like being on the normal VAT scheme Yeah. in, in that sense. So going backwards, there's no restrictions. Going forwards, I'm probably look, it probably looks weird on the wrong way on this camera. But anyway, going forwards, um, yes, it's the £2,000 rule. But where some accountants fall down is thinking that it applies going backwards. But because I've been for an inspection with HMRC on it and they agreed with me. So he's replied saying, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly yeah. So I, I did have a conversation with another gym owner whose, whose accountant said no. And she was claiming back like 2K. And I was like, it's not right. It's not right. He's like, I gave her the actual bits of. Um, the extract to go back to the accountant with. And that's what I did with HMRC. So it's all on their website. Nice. Okay. So let's talk about VAT and taxes then when it comes to uh, the difference between franchising and owning multiple studios. So if you're the owner of multiple studios and franchising the business, is there different tax rates and VAT rates for those type of setups or that again, just be classed as the same thing? Um, I don't really deal with any franchises. But my understanding is it's the same because you're just then paying a franchise fee to the franchiser. Yeah. Um, and that's just a fee in your business that comes off the profit. So that's my understanding, but I don't actually deal with any franchises. <laughs> cool. No, that's okay. Okay. So uh, we've gone right from the start. Now we're paying VAT and everything. And now there's a lot of money coming into the business. And we feel like it's now time we start getting paid a proper wage. So then we can get paid. £50,000 at 20% and then anything over 50 is 40%. Is that correct? Yeah, anything over 50 to 70, if you want to be specific. So <laughs> how, um, how can these real big business owners who are getting paid £200,000, £300,000 a year get away with paying minimal tax where we then have to pay 20% on the first 52750 but then we've got to pay 40% on any additional over? 
Um, <clears throat> so pretty much all accountants would advise you to take a salary dividend split. So you would take a low salary. Um, that could either be at the national insurance threshold or it could be at the 12, 5, whatever it is. I can't remember, 12, 5, 70. So they would advise you to take that as your salary and then you would take the rest as dividends. And actually, it's quite an important conversation coming up to year end or you know tax year end because the dividend allowance at the moment is um, £2,000 is tax free assuming you don't get dividends from anywhere else. And come April, that allowance drops to a £1,000. And then the following April, it drops to £500. Oh. So it's actually really important right now to be considering, is your business in a profitable position? Do you have reserves? Can you pay yourself dividends? And if you don't have the cash to pay the dividends, you can put it direct to, to, to director's loan account. You will have to declare it on your tax return, but if it's £2,000, you won't pay any tax. If it's over that, it's then taxed at like your rate of int your rate of um, tax, which is like the first section is 8.75, and then it goes up and up. So any accountant would tell you to take a salary dividend split and not cool. pull it all out as salary. Um, once you start getting onto the higher values, that's when more and more and more tax planning comes in place and you might be using pension schemes you obviously will be taking your trivial benefits you might look at other schemes you might look at electric cars you'll start then looking at other ways of extracting money that isn't going to cost you tax and planning your spend so corporation tax is going up next uh, in april um, for anyone oh, earning over 50k profit so you would then be looking to plan your spending. Like, is it better spending this year? Or actually, should you just wait <laughs> till next year um, to spend next tax year? I mean, so to spend that money to reduce your profit down next year to help reduce your corporation tax bill. So it's becoming more and more important over the next couple of months to really plan what you're doing. Nice. OK. So let's let's look at planning and saving for tax and VAT and your own personal tax and all this stuff as well. Is it once a month you kind of see what your profits were and then you just kind of put a little pot aside and you put it all there? Or so you just take a certain amount every single day out, you kind of work that little equation and you'd put a certain amount every way every single day or every single week? Or what is the best way to kind of save for tax and VAT at the end of the year? Um, some people will do it weekly, <clears throat> but some people will do it monthly. And, you know, like you've got Starling Bank. So uh, what I do is I use Starling Bank and then the, is it called Spaces? Our oh, Spaces, yeah. Yeah. So it's Spaces on Starling. If you're doing profit first, it's POTS. Um, and you would take, you would split your profit and you would put some into corporation tax some into VAT because it's really important to remember that VAT is paid every quarter so it's not yeah. your money and it's really it can get difficult each quarter and suddenly people are like, oh what I've got to pay two and a half grand VAT or some oh. of my clients are like 15 grand VAT um but if you're putting that aside every single month it's there ready to go so you'd have to put your yeah corporation tax your VAT um any money you've got to pay for like PAYE um your profit so getting your dividend pot set aside ready to take dividends if you want to and just breaking it down into like percentages so we kind of what's your percentage spend in each area so i have like staff software my memberships um my profit corporation tax and then i work out the percentage of my profit and then like every month i put it into those brackets based on those percentages Nice. Okay. Which sounds more complicated than it is, but it's not. It's not that complicated. Oh. Although the tax going up, the VAT going up, and all those other changes that you're talking about, then it's scary. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask a question for me now. Then and that question is: How can I potentially reduce the amount of um, student loan I need to pay every year, or is there any way of 
maybe paying for it in full now so then I can not have to pay as much interest or I can get it cut down a massive chunk or something. Yeah, you don't realise this when you go to uni, you think, oh, I have free money, and then now you're like, oh, no. Yeah, I think I still owe like five and a half grand on mine um, because I haven't been paying it for a few years now Um, because if you can keep your salary at a certain level, you don't we don't pay any, but um, I checked on it a few months ago and the interest rate has just gone like, <laughs> gone up quite a lot. Um, so I've looked to pay off chunks of it. So you can log into your student loan account and you can just pay what you want when you yeah, want, really. Yeah. There are um, percentages, especially people who went after me, um, having to pay quite a lot back now. So it's worth remembering that when you're earning money. The more money you make, the more student loan you're going to have to pay back. I think my bracket is, it was 17. It might be 19K now where you've got to start paying back. Um, But I've decided to start just paying chunks every month, allocating some money towards it because then I think at least it's paying off. But student loan is obviously one of those loans where it doesn't come into account when you're doing certain things like mortgages and that because actually if you don't earn enough money you won't pay it it's not like a normal loan um and for some people especially people that went after i went it gets written off after like 30 years i think so it's worth knowing when you went to uni and is your loan going to get written off mine's not so but you don't know any schemes or anything out there because i I know there was one a few years back where if you paid a certain amount you could get a certain percentage shaved off you don't know any kind of um schemes or anything that gets people to pay that off quicker to save money no not that i'm aware of no it's not something that i'm massively deal with (laughs) no that's fine so the next question then let's look at mortgages something you just mentioned now so i'm guessing lots of people who go self-employed uh struggle to kind of get mortgages what are kind of some of the ways to not have that struggle not have get so many questions asked to you when you put in for the mortgage it's important to remember that hmrc are going to ask for not hmrc the mortgage um providers are going to ask to see your accounts so this is when it might be beneficial to have an accountant doing your accounts and signing off the numbers Um, some mortgage providers will require that and some won't and also working with like a mortgage um, advisor can help because they will know the mortgages that um, don't require so many years of um, accounts so some will require three years of accounts and the problem that's what this big problem came when covid came because pe- people were getting some people were getting these grants off of hmrc um the self-employed whatever it was called grant and mortgage companies were saying well that's not really income because that's just been given to you you've not earned that and you're not showing that the business is viable so I know people were experiencing problems with having those grants on their um, accounts, but there's nothing you can do about that. So yeah. speaking to a mortgage advisor early, a decent one, <laughs> who can provide good advice around what you're going to need, or will you need an accountant to sign them off, um, how much income do you need? Because obviously everyone's trying to pay less tax, so they're pushing costs through the business and through their accounts. But obviously that means that your income is less yeah yeah I, I, not not thought of it that way actually either um okay that's an interesting one okay so i've asked a load of questions now is there any questions you think maybe i should have asked that i haven't asked that other um that all fit pros should know when it comes to finances and tax and VAT and literally anything like that <laughs> um I guess for me, the big one of the biggest things is I, I do talk about concentrating on costs and cost reduction and eliminating any unnecessary costs. But what can happen in, say, like the current period, like a recession, is people get over focused on it and they try and slash costs everywhere, say like marketing, um, going with a cheap accountant, all those sort of things. But that can actually have a detrimental impact on the business because some of those costs are necessary for the running of the business and the growth of the business. And so you don't just want to 
cut everything. You want to have a strategic plan about what costs are not needed. So one of my clients cut like Zoom and Netflix, things that they weren't using that come from COVID. And the ones that are growing at the moment that I've worked with, they're focusing on lead generation and retention. So it's looking at, so when we talk about numbers, I'm not just talking about financial numbers, it's all numbers in your business. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have grown are looking at lead conversion, what can they do to increase that? Um, how can they keep retention up? And it's, so understanding your numbers isn't just financial. Some of the biggest impacts you can have can be on increasing your sales because increasing your sales is almost limitless. It's only based on the size of your unit. Whereas cutting costs, you can only go so far. So the things that I've seen changing things at the moment are actually picking up the phone and following leads up. Things that maybe some of the business owners didn't want to do. And now they have to. So they're doing it and they're seeing results from it. So for me, that's one of the things. And two is working on your money mindset. Um, like I said, with VAT, people get stuck because they fear VAT. They fear their clients won't pay. Um, they feel greedy for asking for more money. They worry that people can't afford it. But that's all within you. And understanding that it's not scary. You can do it. And having confidence in that and moving through those stories you have can mm. really help push your business forward. It's certainly what's helped me push my business forward because I had those fears. I'm greedy if I charge that. Um, it's not fair to people that can't afford to work with me. And I've had to work through those things. So they're kind of two non-financial things that I've seen help businesses. Nice. Okay. Actually, I've just got one more question then before we finish, because we do have a number of online fit pros we work with or that follow the channel or listening and stuff. Now, their tax and VAT stuff might be different if they're based in the UK, but they're working with clients in the US or Australia or um dubai and stuff how does the tax and vat affect those people are they allowed to charge uh vat let's say for ireland for example are they allowed to charge their clients in ireland vat or is there a way that they can note that down it's an irish client so they don't have to charge for vat so they're not having to pay vat foreign vat is something that i've avoided um mm -hmm. but generally with services it's about where the service is conducted so you would normally say it's a UK business conducting business in the UK. Uh, the operations are in the UK. So it's UK VAT. But I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay. No, that's fine. That's I don't have any clients that. doing that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that kind of it kind of varies. I guess you specialize mainly in uh, UK businesses, gyms, studios, and boot camps and stuff. Yeah. So you, you know, like um, Zoom and Canva not Canva, Zoom, um, what's the other company that does it? Is it Stripe? They're based in Ireland, so they yeah. um, they do like reverse charge of VAT. So they've based themselves there for purpose so that they can trade with the UK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's cheaper. Cool. No, that's great. Um, okay, so for any studio, gym, boot camps, PTs, people getting started basically here in the UK and they're like, wow, Debbie's talking lots of sense. I need to speak to her to see if I'm overpaying or underpaying or if I'm going to be trouble. How can people reach out to you and have this chat? So I'm pretty much on Facebook most of the time. So that's how I speak to most people. And on my profile, I believe there is a link to book a 20 minute initial call with like no expectations just to see if we could work together. Um, and what problems you kind of have at the moment. So that's probably the best way just to get a feel. Because for me, working with an accountant is very personal. That's the way I think it should be anyway. You should have a good relationship with your accountant. So you're talking something very personal with them. So I think you should have a chat with them, see if you feel comfortable with them. And then move forward into another discussion around what services, pricing, etc. 
Nice, nice. Cool, yeah. So if anybody's struggling with their finances, their VAT, literally anything to do with money or numbers at all, definitely reach out to Debbie and have a chat. Debbie, I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you for your time. We're closing in on an hour, so it's a lot of content for people to take. People write notes, or like oh, I'm trying to remember things. But yeah, feel free to come back, check out the blog, or reach out to Debbie if you need anything. Uh, but Debbie, thank you for coming on, and we'll get you on further down the line. Thank you. Have a good day. No problem. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us this week on another guest interview. Each and every Monday, we try and bring you a brand new guest interview to help you grow and scale your fitness business. As usual, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, don't forget to subscribe below. And if you want to watch these interviews live and ask questions, then come and join us inside the free Facebook group. I'll speak to you all next week. Cheers.